All right, well, let's do this. It's time to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm John Soroka with Soroka Brand Development and the Mortgage Technology and Marketing Committee Chair. And welcome to our webinar today, Planning Strategic Initiatives for 2019. Before we get started, I have a message from our sponsor, Real Estate Services Trust, which provides employee health benefits to the mortgage banking industry. Are you looking for high quality employee benefits that don't break the bank? We have an employee benefit solution that could be a game changer for your organization. Established in partnership with Marsh and McLennan Agency, a nationwide top leading brokerage firm, the Real Estate Services Trust provides real estate service and services industry employers competitive benefit plan options at affordable rates. By leveraging the health risk demographic of the real estate services industry to create a larger pool of risk, the trust provides employers lower premiums, consistent renewals below trend, and robust plan options. Of course, saving money is great, but the benefits don't stop there. The trust provides many value-added services, from an easy-to-use online enrollment portal to employee advocacy and legislative guidance, the Real Estate Services Trust offers employers exclusive tools and resources to complement their benefits program at no additional cost. Find out if your company is qualified to take advantage of the Real Estate Services Trust today. And now for our topic of the day, ladies and gentlemen, as you think about how to grow your market share in 2019, you need to hone in on activities that are going to give you great exposure and allow you to communicate your brand effectively and efficiently. And you also need to stay compliant while doing so. So today we have two premier industry experts to talk about hot marketing techniques and staying in compliance. So with us today, I am thrilled to present to you Greg Pedersen, the Digital Marketing Manager and Loan Officer at RWM Home Loans, and Karen Cullen, Director of Compliance and Fair and Responsible Lending at Crosscheck Compliance. By way of some background, this webinar is a production of the Mortgage Technology and Marketing Committee. The committee was formed to support the development and dissemination of new technologies and marketing strategies that the mortgage industry needs to embrace. As we go through this, please submit your questions and I will direct them to the right individual as they come up, or you can wait until the Q&A time at the end. And with that, over to you, Greg. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. As you said, my name is Greg Pedersen. I'm with RWM Home Loans. I am an originator. I'm a California mortgage broker. I also help our marketing team and all of our digital media, digital marketing online. So as we jump into it, one thing we forgot to mention I am a millennial, which is, uh, <laughs> I know that's a joke. Every conference I go to, there's always that session on what are millennials thinking? What are they doing? How do we market to millennials? So you have one live here speaking to you directly. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for jumping on here and giving us the next hour of your time. A part of that is going to be my goal to give you back that plus some. So, here, hopefully I provide enough value to add three hours of time back to your schedule if you give me your undivided attention. As we go over our topic today, I'm going to be discussing the top five must-do activities for originators this year. As you sit down and plan the new year, hopefully you've already done that. If not, I highly encourage you to do that and use this as a template to guide your marketing plans for the upcoming 12 months. Part of that's going to be planning your social calendar incorporating video easily, how to retarget your past clients and prospects, as well as developing custom audiences on social media with a low-cost spend to still get in front of them. It's not enough anymore just to send out emails and text messages. There's different mediums that people expect you to be on. The fourth is online reputation evaluate, evaluation. Excuse me, And fifth is personalizing your autom automation. So don't set it and forget it. You need to get in there and make sure it sounds like you and everything's personalized. So without further ado, let's jump to number one. All right. So social media is a absolute beast. But here I'm going to narrow the scope and provide you with a plan to make it easy on your life. 
step one is how to brainstorm and develop those post ideas going out to all of your platforms. The main ones we like to focus on is LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Some people may all also utilize Twitter, um, have their own blogs, etc. Number two is how to set up a content calendar. So just like anything, one thing I've been really trying to focus on in 2019 is pre-planning everything I do. So the night before, write down everything I have to do the next day. The morning of, look it over. Same thing for Sundays. I want to plan out my week ahead of time. For January, I want to plan out that month ahead of time. The same concept goes for social media to be successful. So I've written down a bunch of post ideas. And here are top 10 you could take from me, you could incorporate in your, in your planning. Just really quick, client reviews, networking events, closings, and client photos. Utilize those times to create content and get that out to your social media for that social proof. Open house events, if you're sitting in open houses, that is a great resource for content online to get out to the masses. Mortgage market information, inspirational or motivation posts. Those are really popular. I know there's a lot of gurus out there these days, but sometimes it's fun to incorporate that in your posts. Blog writing or article writing. So that makes you sound like the professional in your field, in your industry, if you could write on a specific topic. It's very important. Any philanthropy events. It shows that you give back and you care about your community and that you're involved and you have extracurricular activities as well as seminars, which shows that you're staying educated and you're, you're keeping up with the times of your industry and you know what's coming down the pipeline, what's coming in the future, and you're trying to improve and better yourself. And then education out to your audience and education out to your clients. And what this shows is that you care about their well-being. You're not just there trying to sell them. You're trying to educate them and truly help them create the best transaction that they can receive. So. After we get all this together, we're also going to jump into step three, which is how to use posting tools and, and different tools that are out there on the market for automation. I have a, a select few that I think everybody could utilize and really enjoy. Some of us may already be using them because they're quite popular. All right, so how do you plan your social calendar ahead of time? And this is also called a content calendar. So my first action plan to give you back your hour that you're investing here today is I've actually attached a handout to this presentation. So if, if everybody would please go open up the settings for this presentation and click handouts, you'll see it right there. It's called RWM Social Posting Calendar. And this is a template through Excel that we use. Here's a little picture of it to break out each day of the week, what time it's going to go out, what the content is, and what the link is, whether it's a video, image, or a text post. And this is going to save you a ton of time. It takes hours to create these social calendars. We have the template ready right here for you. And if you are watching this webinar and a recording in the future, or if you're not live here today, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or send me an email at gregp at rwmloans.com. I'd be happy to email you over the calendar if you're not here live with us today. But this is so important. So open it up, take a look at it. This calendar breaks down day by day, once again, the exact time. And you could, step one is writing all your content down, planning your post, putting it in this content calendar. And the next one we go through these automation tools, you could just copy and paste and select which time you want these to go out in the future. So for example, what I will do is I'll sit down on Sundays in my department here at RWM Home Loans. We'll sit down every Monday, and we'll also pre-plan for the month ahead. So the last two days of the month, depending when that falls on, we will sit down and plan out our calendar for February, for example. We'll think about all the events we have coming up, any um, seminars that we're helping agents with, any home buying workshops, Etc. We'll, we'll plan that all out and then we'll see where we can fill the gaps. If any of our employees or loan officers have birthdays or if a big event's coming up. So that's how we map out our social calendar. We sit down, we pre plan it. And this is the template you all can use for that. I suggest sitting down on a Sunday before your week thinking about what client meetings do I have coming up? Um, what signings? Do I have any reviews that have recently come in from my clients? 
et cetera. So here are some tools to help you because I understand that as you're planning this calendar, you might be thinking, I am not a designer. I'm not a social media guru. I'm not a marketing guru. How can you expect me to do all this? But part of that is just sitting down and start writing out copy. And you'll see in one of my sections in this template I gave you, it'll actually show something that I do from a personal level, breaking down the content, how I write it. It doesn't have to be long. It just has to be something you could get out there to the market. So some of the tools to help you be successful and help, e help ease this process for you is Hootsuite, Zoho, Meet Edgar, or your CRM. So these are all automated posting tools. So we personally use Hootsuite here at RWM, as well as we like to use Total Expert, which is our CRM system, to automate different posts and get different content out there for loan officers. But, but for Hootsuite, me personally as an originator, this really helps me plan things ahead of time. I can sit down on a Sunday, put everything into Hootsuite. Hootsuite manages my Instagram, my LinkedIn, and my Facebook platforms, as well as many others. I could say the exact I could upload the picture ahead of time, the content, the time I want to go out, et cetera. So it looks like I'll be posting constantly the upcoming week, and, and whoever utilizes this when I work with my loan officers as well, it looks like they're constantly active on social media, and they're really on top of their game. But what people don't understand is they only had a time block, maybe two hours on a Sunday, to plan all those posts going out the week. And and you know what they say, it, it's best to condense everything into one sitting than to do it as you go throughout your, your day and your, your week coming up, right? If you had to log in every time, think of the content post, you constantly have to switch your brain out of whatever you're doing at that time and then into that setting of planning your calendar. And what that means is when you keep switching back and forth and you don't condense everything into one topic, your brain has to switch in and out and you actually end up spending probably double the time it would take. So this is a way to be really efficient and be consistent. The next is Canva, Unsplash, and Pixabay. These are all services you could use to edit photos or download free photos so you can have that professional photography and professional looking content on your social media. You don't have to be a marketing guru for some basics like this. Just utilize these services and you'll be good to go. All right, so now that we talked about planning your social media, we're now going to talk about how to incorporate video. 2019, the buzz is getting out there, filming, and I understand it could be a process that's a little bit uneasy, and not a lot of people like to put their face in front of the camera, but we've broken down a bunch of topics and things that you could do to incorporate video, and also different formats you could do that in. So, so video isn't just a singular thing. It's not just taking you know taking a video of yourself or having somebody else take a video of yourself as you can see you could do a selfie and those have become very popular a lot of you might have seen a, a big marketer called Ty Lopez and he became super popular off doing a selfie video called in my garage and he has his Lamborghini and his Ferrari behind him and all his books and now he's just blown up but his his forte is the selfie video and that's what he does Another a lot of people like to utilize, probably the most common, is, is more of a cameraman view. So you can set up a tripod and film yourself, and I'm going to be going over the equipment you would need to do something like this, how to set up a tripod and start and stop your camera remotely so you don't have to have somebody helping you. The next is an interview style, and this adds a great dynamic to your video. So it's you and then another person you're talking back and forth, so it's not as awkward of you just staring directly at the camera um, it adds a, a different element to the video that's quite unique. The last that's super popular is motion graphics. So don't worry, you do not have to be a graphic designer, once again, or a marketing superstar. All you have to do is, is go on Fiverr, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but what that will um, enable you to do is you could pay anywhere between $20 to $100 to have a, a nice motion graphics video done for you. And those are really... Excellent. If you look up here above these photos, you'll see we have a bunch of ideas for you. So incorporate video for caravans or open houses. You can do an open house walkthrough. Talk about your favorite component of the home. You can do a lifestyle video. Do you like running on the beach? Do you like doing sit-ups? 
John Soroka, when we were going over this, told me he loves to film himself doing sit-ups and working out, and that's his lifestyle video. <laughs> so, you know, you can really get creative with it, do whatever you would like. Once again, market updates, I see Bill Bodner, who has been on some webinars with us, he's always on LinkedIn doing market updates. I think it's excellent. I watch them. Um, client testimonials, if you could maybe encourage your clients, do a gift card or something, and, and maybe Karen could talk about the compliance around that, but whatever you can do to help get those video testimonials out there, I mean, talk about social proof if your client is in front of a camera giving a emotional testimonial on how amazing you are and how you help their life with their financing or get into their first home or refinance to consolidate their debt. I mean, that's just incredible. And the next is educational or explainer, motivational um, emails. We're going to talk about in the next slide a little bit. One service is BombBomb, Bomb, which many of you may have heard of. It's an excellent way to incorporate video and emails. And then loan presentations. Here at RWM, all of our loan officers have access to Mortgage Coach. And a part of that platform is filming video on your loan presentations. And the clients absolutely love it. In a world, when we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but when technology helps you become a little bit impersonal, this helps you be, make it personal, having a video explaining the details right there for your client to see when they open up your loan presentation. So here we'll jump to the next slide and go over a couple solutions and tools and um, items we could purchase and what that budget looks like to become a video superstar internally and easily. So incorporating video, how do you do it, right? We just talked about the formats of thing and, and the topics you could jump on to film, but then there's a whole other element. Well, I don't have, you know, I want to be able to eliminate excuses. So I don't have the equipment, I don't have the setup, I don't have the lighting. Well, here you can do all of that for under $1,000. And a lot of this you can even do under $500. Not only that, if you have a marketing department in your branch or at your office, you can probably convince them to purchase this for you or get together with a bunch of your loan officer partners in your office and all pitch in to get these resources and then share them if it's something you're seriously considering. So basic equipment. You're going to want a camera, obviously. Me personally, I had to get a new phone about six months ago. I opted for the best phone I could. I love iPhones, so I got the iPhone X. And the reason why is it's the best camera on the iPhones at that moment because I knew I was going to start incorporating more video into my weeks and my day-to-day. -day. So I wanted to get, you know, I didn't want to pay extra money for, for a different camera like the Canon PowerShot G7. That's a portable point-and-shoot camera, which means, it's, it's just like your mom and dad's old camera they probably used to take to, well, my mom and dad, because I'm young, but, but you guys probably had the camera. <laughs> some, some people here are probably old enough to be my mom or my dad. Um, but it, it was a camera you used to take on a family vacation. You pull it out, just an easy point and shoot. But now they have them so high quality that the point and shoot cameras produce absolutely incredible footage. And one thing I didn't notice is I put this Canon power shot on as a top camera to get. John Soroka actually uses this camera for all of his videos. So if you've seen any recent video from John, it's crystal clear, looks highly professional. And according to John, he says this is the camera he uses, and it's about $650. And we're going to blast through the rest of this really fast. A tripod, most people probably know, you screw your camera to it, it's stationary. That just helps you when you're shooting um, yourself so somebody doesn't have to sit there holding it. A gimbal, uh, some of you might have seen the video I shot for this webinar on my LinkedIn, but as I was walking around shooting the video, you might wonder how, how I was able to walk around with a stable video. Part of that was a gimbal. So the gimbal helps reduce any movement and different motion in your video. It keeps your camera steady as, you're, as you incorporate movement into your footage. And I have that. It, it connected with my iPhone X. And my personal gimbal, gimbal was only $150. And then a shutter start and stop remote. So what this does is it's a Bluetooth little button that you could have in your hand. And it'll, if you click it, it'll take a picture or it could start and stop your video remotely. So if you're on a tripod five feet away from your camera, you don't have to run up, click record, run back and start. You can just have this little portable remote. 
I bought mine off Amazon. It was about ten to twenty dollars, but it, the exact term to search is shutter, start, and stop remote. The next is a lighting rig. Lighting is very important in video, and it's, it's probably one of the most important components, just because cameras are very high quality now. So, I recommend going on Amazon or anywhere else buying a, a quick two light lighting set and that could run you anywhere between hundred to two hundred dollars once you start getting in the two hundred dollar range they might also include like a white black and green backdrop which is important if you're doing a little bit more sophisticated video or if you're sending it over to an editor to help you out a little bit they might want that steady background but the next is also making sure your voice is crystal clear so that is having a microphone so you so one popular microphone. This one plugs into laptops. It's called the Blue Microphone. It's the Snowball ICE edition. It's about $50. Dustin Hobbs actually told me he has this one. He loves it and the sound is crystal clear. So we have one proof here that it's a great microphone. Another John Soroka uses is, if he wants to jump in, I think it's called the Zip. Is that right, John? Uh, it is the H1, the Zoom H1N. Zoom. It was Zoom. Okay, so he uses the Zoom H1N, I believe you just said. And does that plug into your your Canon camera, right? Or is it is it your mobile phone? No, it's a, no, it's a it's actually a totally separate recorder. I see. Okay, yeah. so so that's nice. So you can record and, and I, and crystal I, clear I, audio. And I frequently use it to give marketing tips to people while I'm doing, while I'm filming my sit-ups with, um, with one <laughs> hand, with my other hand, I'm giving people marketing tips on my microphone. I love it. So you multitask. Is that part of your uh, New Year's resolution to multitask your sit-ups? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, one thing I didn't add, guys, is John Soroka also uses a teleprompter. So you could actually go online and buy a super easy teleprompter. Some of them will, will key in no, directly. No, no, with Greg, your... Greg, no, I don't yeah. use a teleprompter. Everything that you see is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, was a, that was a secret I divulged. I uh, probably should have cleared that by you. Um, <laughs> anyway, teleprompter, <laughs> teleprompters could help you a lot and you can actually get them if you already have an iPad which most people do you could get teleprompter apps and, and different things like that but what that will allow you to do is you could you could pre put your script through the teleprompter and I've heard of it cutting down people's takes in video it just makes it easier to film video you have everything you're gonna say right there and it cuts it down from let's say you have to take 10 to 15 takes to get the video right because you keep stumbling on your words and trying to remember your script it could cut that down to about two or three takes for film and and hopefully everything you say is pretty spot on so that's all the equipment that that we could utilize and if you already have a camera you'll see here that you could get a full professional video set up and be ready to rock and roll for under $500 and if you split that with some colleagues, it's going to be far cheaper. Now, editing video, there's a couple apps out there. There's mobile apps called Splice and Quick. Those are owned by GoPro. You can get those for free on your mobile phone. Another one's called InShot and Wii Video. Once again, you don't have to be a professional video editor. The technology out there is incredible for how easy it is to jump in and make great content. And I encourage everybody, don't get caught up on, on trying to make everything perfect and make your film perfect because as you keep moving forward it'll get better and better and the goal is only to get the content out there and get the quality content out there it does not have to be perfect so if you get bogged down in the minutia of analyzing your video a lot of times you're more critical of yourself than others will be so please just get that video out there the first couple times probably not a lot of people are going to watch it anyway and you'll be good to go Here's a few um, computer software items or, or pieces you could use. iMovie, one you have to buy, that's, that's a third party software to make video editing very easy on your computer, it's called Movavi. Um, Microsoft used to have Filmmaker, I believe it was called, now they moved it to Microsoft Photos. And then as I said, if you want to incorporate video in your emails, you could use BombBomb. In BombBomb, um, they actually have a lot of people in the mortgage industry using this. Our BombBomb ties into our total expert account and some other services we use. 
so it's really handy and we could get um, some pretty good video out there to our, our prospects and our past clients. And then the last, if, if you don't even want to touch the video, you just want to film it and give it out to somebody else, or you want to create your own motion graphic explainer video or anything like that, I highly encourage you to check out Fiverr. Um, depending on what you're trying to do, it's it's not medium to low quality video, but but it, it's a good price point. So it helps you get the content out there. If you're looking to do a huge professional shoot, probably hire a professional. But for anything we're looking to do, Fiverr's probably okay. All right. I know I'm going through a lot of stuff. I'm going to hurry through this pretty quick because I know Karen's going to want to jump in and speak. But the next thing I want everybody to think about is retargeting your prospects and people who you've interacted with on different social media accounts and custom audiences. And if we look at this infographic here, you'll see what it looks like. So a pr prospective client um, or even a past client may have visited your website. You start tracking them just with different back-end tracking pixels and cookies. It's a little bit complicated stuff, but some people might understand. And then it goes to you know, that person leaves your website, so how do you continue to market with them if you never capture their email, your phone number, or their phone number? Um, or maybe you even have that, but you still want to market to them through different avenues. Through retargeting, your ad could then pop up on other sites they visit, or if they leave your website and go back to Facebook, or go back to LinkedIn, or search through Google, your face could still be up there. And this also incorporates with YouTube. If you do start filming video and get good at it, you could even run your own retargeting video ads and bring those people back and be in front of them. So here I, I put a little slogan here. It's not enough to just put your clients and prospects on a drip email campaign anymore and hope they return. It's important to use retargeting and these custom audiences to stay in front of them. And there's a lot of content out there depending on where you want to go to set up your retargeting or custom audiences. And let me explain the difference. So retargeting is like I just said, somebody video, uh, visits your website, there's a little tracking code that gets attached to them in their browser on their computer. And then when you go to Facebook, Google, or LinkedIn, they could read that tracking and know they came from your site so it knows to start pushing those ads from you out to them. The other is custom audiences, so you have more control of who this goes out to directly. And this means, let's say a loan officer has been in the business for 10 years and you have a huge database of clients, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 people. You could upload those lists to a lot of these platforms. So let's say, for example, Facebook, you could upload your 2,000 person list. A lot of times it's only first name and email, sometimes you could incorporate uh, sorry, first name, last name, email. Sometimes you can incorporate phone number, etc. But then what Facebook will do is they'll scan that sheet of data and then look through all their archives of data they have and match everybody from your template versus everybody they have in their system. And let's say out of 1,000 people, you get a 60% match. So now you know out of those 1,000, 600 people are on Facebook, and then you can start sending individual ads very low cost ads to those individuals and retarget them and, and be in front of them. So it's similar to sending out like a direct mail postcard or anything like that, but now you're doing it digitally for lower cost and it's going to them immediately. So here we'll jump on the next slide. Once again, um, Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn and Google, these are the three platforms that are the most common to do this on and, and there's some other tools out there that, that can help automate it. Um, one's called Ad, AdRoll and there are a few others just depending on how big your database is and how big your spend is. But for Facebook, you'll first, here are a few steps and this is very complex stuff. I don't have time to dive into it deep on a rich level, maybe a different webinar for everybody. But you could take these key points and then start doing your own research. There's tons of content on YouTube explaining how to do this, or, or if you just search Google, or for each of these platforms, they have their own resource areas so you could train yourself how to do this and step by step. I personally love YouTube because I could watch the video. They walk me through how to set all this up personally. But Facebook and Instagram, here are some key steps. You'll probably want to set up your Facebook business manager account, which is just an account that manages all of your stuff on Facebook or just set up a personal ads account if you don't want to set up a full business manager account. 
The next is to make sure you activate a tracking pixel. And this is the code that will go on your website that follows them around the internet to tell Facebook that they're the person that the ad needs to go to. And you could install that on a web page. If you have a marketing department, they may be able to help you if they allow that. Um, I know here we help our loan officers with that. The next is uploading a data file to Facebook to match a custom audience. So once again, like I said, you could pull all your data and upload to Facebook. So it's a similar process for each of these platforms. LinkedIn's a little bit unique because LinkedIn only allows you to do this if you actually have a business profile. So a lot of loan officers, like here, a lot of our loan officers just have their own profile. Um, then RWM has our personal business profile. So through my RWM account, I could do this. Through my personal account, I cannot. Um, so depending if your company will let you, you would actually have to create an official business page on LinkedIn for yourself, and that would open up the advertising portal that you can use. And then Google. All you have to do, Google is pretty easy. You just create an ads account on Google. It's uh, just Google AdWords. Once again, you activate that code and upload your data file. And then you could be off the races. After you do this, you could start using all the content you do for planning out your social calendar for the week, and then you start advertising with that or anything else you want to get in front of your clients. And hopefully, if you have a marketing department, once again, they could help walk you through that or help create the content for you. Okay. In today's day and age, I really hope you have an excellent online reputation and you are on a lot of these platforms. It's, it's quite incredible a lot of people um, that I see that are still somewhat ghosts online. And the question you should be asking yourself is, am I visible? If I Google my name, am I visible online? Do my profiles pop up? And would I do business with myself based on what others are saying? So, so based on that, we have a few review platforms that we really enjoy and focus on. We call these the core four, Google, Zillow, Yelp, and Redfin. And you may be a little bit surprised by Redfin that, that this one's in the mix. And the reason why this one's in the mix is Redfin is actually highly valuable because not just anybody can go on and set up an account for Redfin. You would have actually had to close of a loan or close a transaction with somebody on Redfin to open up your portal, that person would have had to leave you a review, attach your name to it, and that makes your portal active. Then as a loan officer, you actually have to go in, see if you have a page active on Redfin, and click claim this page. So you actually have to go in and claim it to give you access to edit your photo, edit your description, etc. So it's, it's quite a process to not only get an account created on Redfin and you don't have any control over that, and then go in and claim your account. So I encourage you to look to see if you do have a review on, account on Redfin and then claim it. Redfin drives a lot of business and that's good for you because if you have an account on there, people are probably going to be looking through in your local area for lenders and you're a lot more likely, unless you're one of the top guys on Zillow and hopefully some people here are, but you're more likely to get a transaction off of Redfin than Zillow just because Zillow accepts free accounts, everybody's on Zillow, so you really just get pushed down with everybody else. The next is Google. I prefer Google over any of them because they've changed their algorithms a lot lately. And um, Google reviews, if you have good reviews and you have a location set up for yourself wherever your office is, if anybody in that local area is looking for a mortgage transaction, you'll come up at the top of Google because Google puts their maps and their reviews even before their regular organic searches if somebody's looking for a mortgage near me or a loan officer near me or a mortgage company near me, whatever it may be, you'll come up at the top if you focus on getting your Google reviews built up. And then Yelp, self-explanatory. Um, Zillow's great too. But once again, requesting reviews, just do it. If you can, if you don't have any automated systems in place with your company or you personally just ask for reviews from your past clients, here we use social survey and our CRM system to automate review requests. Um, so it's, it's one thing we're focusing on is trying to automate this process just to cut down time so our originators could be out there and hitting the pavement and driving more business. So let's jump over to number five and then I'll get off and let Karen jump in. So the 
fifth and final thing that I want you to look at and think about in the new year is personalizing your automation. And that's something we've been really trying to do here for the last year is looking through all of our content and figuring out different ways that it doesn't look like our clients are just on an automated set and forget it type thing. And a part of that has been making sure that we're covering the basics so that we have those prospect campaigns going out, open house campaigns, happy birthday messages, annual loan review requests, and loan status updates throughout the process. Now these are pretty common, so I'm hoping everybody has at least achieved this, that they have these campaigns set up going out. If not, it's important to find a way to do it, or maybe you're doing it personally. Some of these maybe you don't want to automate. That's completely fine. But out of these messages, now review the content being sent on your behalf if these have been sent up by your company and see what's truly going out. Does it use your actual email signature? And this is huge. There's not a more blaring red flag as if you're emailing a client from your Outlook account or Google, whatever you use, and your email looks one way, and then all of a sudden they get an email from an automated system that looks another way. Immediately you lose credibility because they know okay, one actually came from you and one actually came from an automated system. And now they think, oh, well, this guy just put me in an automated system. What the heck? I mean, it's a little bit frustrating because our inboxes get clogged up as it is. Does it sound like it's coming from you directly? Look over the content, see if, it, if it's your look and feel of, of what you would actually send out. Is the messaging appropriate for where your client is in the process? Proper messaging at the right time is very important. If you're sending out a prospect campaign and the person's in process already, you look like an idiot. So don't do that. Make sure everything's getting to them at the right time with the right content, and it sounds like you to help automate your workflow and make your life a lot easier. The next is, are you using their correct name and detail? Something we recently built out was making sure we use the person's name in advertising and marketing and our automation that they like to go by. So somebody's name's Robert, and they like to go by Bob. And if I email them personally, I say, hey, Bob, or hi, Bob, or dear Bob. And if my system's saying Robert because it came from my LOS, then we're going to start having issues, and he knows once again a red flag goes up, and it's an automated system. So here are five things to think about. It's going to be very important that you incorporate these into your day-to-day -day and your planning as well as being compliant when you're focusing on these marketing initiatives. So I'm going to give it over to Karen, and she's going to go over the compliance aspect and some key things to look at. Before you jump over, Greg, this is John Quick. Um, yep. First of all, a uh, question came in for you. Let's go over that quick. But um, these are some really great tips. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Uh, you know, RWM is a great company. They've been growing really fast and uh, which really speaks to uh, Greg as a top-notch marketer and a great team and, and also their, their fantastic leadership. Um, with that, uh, one quick question. Um, how much should someone spend on social advertising and retargeting, Greg? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So once you get it all set up, I mean, you could, you could do, Let's just say start with 20 bucks a week and see where it gets you. With each market and with each, with each territory and message and depending on who you're targeting, as well as how many people are, are accepted. Let's say you upload a custom audience and you do have 600. Um, it's really difficult to say, but I would say exactly. Start out with about 20 bucks a week and, and see where that goes and what traction you're getting. Okay. I, I think that that's... Cover the basis. Yeah, I, I think that that's really good advice. I, I agree with you on that. Um, all right, so before we flip it over, Karen, and to be clear, I don't take videos of myself doing sit-ups, Greg. But even if I did, <laughs> but but just so you know, even if I did, they would be no match for your one-handed chin-up videos that you post. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's on my bodybuilding.com account. You can't be talking about that. <laughs> All right, just kidding. All right, with that, over to you, Karen. Okay, thanks, Greg. Thanks, John. So Greg just discussed some great ideas for your business growth in 2019. And one of the areas that you don't want left behind is ensuring you are aware of the compliance risks that are associated with advertising. Why is this important? Simply put, because your time should be dedicated to building your business 
using a lot of the tools that Greg talked about and meeting your customers' needs, not mitigating the issues that come as a result of forgetting to incorporate compliance into your business. So, and it's really that simple. If you think about the purpose of compliance, which truly is to take consumer compliance laws and implement them consistently through regulation, you can begin to think about what types of risks apply when you're building your marketing activities. So first we're going to talk about, um, before we actually talk about compliance regulation, we're going to, we don't want to forget about partnering with your internal resources. So if you're part of an organization, you should understand the do's and don'ts of your existing policy. So if you haven't already done so, find your compliance, your company's policy on advertising and the process of advertising and see what the expectations are for you to follow before you begin to advertise. Look for process steps that might include how ad copy is handled, if you need to have authorization before sending or posting an ad, or for content or venue that you're using. You want to know the company policy for use of information. We'll talk about compliance guidance around this in a minute, but you should also remember that you need to have awareness of how and where you're using the client information and where you may have obtained it, especially if it's from a previous employer. Most companies prohibit you from using contact information that you obtained while at other institutions. That could have been a bank, a mortgage company, a broker firm. So make sure you have awareness and where that client information is coming from. And if your company is in tune with the ever-changing world of technology, they may have a social media policy. And that's going to give you some guardrails on what your company allows you to do on social media from an advertising standpoint. And those are the venues that Greg already discussed, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all of those different social media outlets. And if your company helps you to establish a website, there's, that's a great avenue as well to talk about what you plan on using your website for with your partners within your company to make sure you're using it for the right reasons and for within the venues that they would like you to use it. Now from a compliance standpoint, we're going to move along to the next slide, which is, and the easiest way to think about compliance from the perspective is there's a fair number of regulations that apply to market, marketing and advertising. And, and really, it, it, it would be very difficult for everyone to memorize all the regulations. And no one's saying you should do this because the regulations vary because they're dependent upon whether or not you're an independent broker or based on the type of organization. But if you think about it, no matter the regulation, when it comes to advertising, the purpose is really around choice, awareness, fairness for that customer or that consumer. So the easiest way to think about it is to put them into three major categories. The first one is identification and privacy. And really key considerations here are, if you're advertising and you're promoting yourself as a lender, make sure you identify yourself. Make sure you have things like your NMLS number. Make sure you have the organization you're associated with, your company name, those types of things so that key con so potential customers and consumers understand who you are. From a privacy perspective, we touched on a little bit about where you got the client list from if you're utilizing them, but you need to think about how you're using contacts information and where you obtain that. You know, if it's current customers, did they already opt out of getting future advertisements? So if you're sending something directly to a customer, like an email, you need to make clear that it's a product or a service. And you, need, you also need to let that person know that, hey, if you don't want to receive this from me anymore, here's how you opt out. So you want to make sure you understand where your information is coming from and how you're going to use it from a privacy perspective. The second real key consideration under the compliance, under those kind of three major categories, is misrepresentation. And when we think about advertising and compliance, misrepresentation is one of the highest risks. So if you think about the regulations that are sitting there in the bubble, that things like RESPA, UDAP, TILA, all of those purposes when it comes to advertising is that you don't mislead or misstate product terms. So first off, you know, key considerations you want to think about is try to keep it simple. Don't mislead. Don't make promises you can't keep. 
Um, you want to think about, again, that the rules are there to create well-informed customers. So think about affiliations and promises that you're making. Be careful not to give the appearance that you're representing a government agency, that you're making promises about knowing what's best for the consumer's financial well-being, because that's where you're going to start to get yourself into trouble if you say the wrong thing and you don't disclose it. Some great examples of this are our recent um, consent orders and attorney general fines that have gone out around this type of affiliation. So let's say, for example, one of them was a bunch of loan officers and lenders that were actually partnering with a marketing company. And they were partnering with a marketing company and a title company. And the title company was providing marketing tools, and it was great. They were sharing client lists and all these things. But the problem was those lenders were then giving referrals to customers that they got in through those client lists and sending them back to that title company. Well, that ended up in a pretty large RESPA violation to the tune of $36 million. So $11 million in, 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 in damages and $24 million in civil money penalties. So you certainly don't want to be a part of something like that. Another affiliation that you need to watch out for is if you're agreeing to, to share client lists with, say, a veterans organization. There was another large $2 million civil million dollar penalty because a company, a mortgage banking company, partnered with a veterans organization sharing client lists, and they were then the kind of the 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 promote they promoted themselves and the veterans organization promoted them as a preferred lender. Well yeah that sounds great and it sounds great for your for your marketing but you have to disclose the fact that you're in essence affiliated with that VA organization because you're exchanging services and that's an affiliation under the rules. So those are the kind of things you have to think about when you're when you're sharing client lists, purchasing client lists, and doing things like making promises about whether or not you're a preferred partner. The other item in this category is trigger terms. And so again, big increased risk if you talk about rates and fees, and if you talk about things like lower cost fees, best rate of all. Remember, you can talk about your products. You can talk about what types of products you offer and what the fees and rates are, but as you get into more detail, detail, there's disclosures that come with it, and you want to make sure you're disclosing it correctly. So again, make sure that you're utilizing partnerships in, in that category. Um, you know, a, a great example of this is a recent advertising um, $500 million, uh, excuse me, $500,000 civil money penalty and retribution because a company, a mortgage banking company was saying that they had the best option for customers to save more money on their VA refinances. You know, when you start to say, we're the best, you're going to save more, if it's not actually happening, you're going to get in trouble. And that's the kind of thing that you don't want to have to worry about, and you certainly don't want your resources going to, to cleaning those kinds of things up, and you certainly don't want your dollars going to paying out those civil money, money penalties. So the last area that we're going to talk about from a compliance perspective is reputational risk and discrimination. And really, this is all about fairness. And it's fairness from a different perspective than misrepresentation, because this is really about discrimination, and that can be very, very high risk. Um, and this really is the area where you are what you say. And what you say and how you say it. You need to be careful. So if you're mixing personal and business social media, or you're doing stuff on Facebook, you're using your personal page, you have to be careful about what type of impression you're giving the receiver. You know, you have to think about things like who is your audience and how would you choose them? You know, are you limiting context? Are you discouraged or are you discouraging or ignoring responses? You have to make sure in this case you're treating your context equally and you're responding to folks equally because, you know, you can't look at a situation and say, you know what, I really want to hit this neighborhood and I'm not going to really target anyone over here because I don't think the house values are very good. You know, we all know what that is. That's, that's a form of redlining. 
You have to make sure that you're not doing anything that might be off-putting to someone that's, say, Hispanic, to someone who's African American. You know, a great example of this, and it kind of ties into what Greg was talking about, you know, your, your social media and your, your evaluations that are out on social media. A great example of a recent issue is the Pennsylvania Attorney General has suspected that in the state of Pennsylvania, there's some disparities in lending. So they've actually gone out and they are asking the public for complaints about specific mortgage bankers and lenders. And they're actually saying to the public, can you tell me if you had difficulty getting an application or if they are not responding to you with an application or you're being left out or you, you're answered an ad and they're not calling you back. So think about that. You could do something very innocently by not treating your contacts evenly or, or equally and you could get on a list from an attorney general. That's certainly not the list you want yourself to be on. You want yourself to be on that list that not only has customer testimonials about how, how, what a great loan product it was, but that you treated them in a fair and equal manner. So you want to make sure that you are looking at your contacts, that you're not limiting where your client lists are coming from, and that when someone does get back in touch with you from one of these blast campaigns that you do, that you're treating them equally. So to quickly recap, because we've only got a few minutes left, remember the reason for the rules. The reasons truly are that you're treating customers fairly and you're giving them a way to make an informed decision. So if you think about these things, if you treat your customers right and you don't mislead them, you will begin to actually mitigate the risks associated with advertising and growing your business. And if you're ever unsure, go find a get an opinion because remember, it's not about you can't, it's about how you can and ensure, and, and when you do, make sure that you have the appropriate control because everyone wants business to grow. We just want it to grow in a compliant way. Okay, great. And, uh, Karen, with that, back to you guys. All right, Karen, thank you very much. Uh, Karen, we've got a question here for you. Um, if you send an email to a prospect or client, about a product, where does it need to be stated that it contains product information? How should it? So that would have to be, be yeah, it would have to be in the title of the email. So in the subject line of the email, you want to let them know in some way, shape, or form that this is in essence an advertisement, an advertisement or a solicitation for business. And then in the body of the email, you want to give them some way of saying to you, please don't send me these anymore. I'd like to, in essence, opt out. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, next question that came in here. Um, this one's for you, Greg. How often should you time block social posts and what day of the week tends to be the best? Yeah, that's a good question. So. I would recommend looking at your schedule a month prior. So a lot of times people do monthly content calendars. And as well as probably on Sundays, because that's most likely maybe Sunday afternoon um, when, when a lot of people won't have a lot going on where you can look ahead at your week and think about what meetings you're going to, what closings you have, what caravans you might be attending, and any, any one-off or, or new events that have come up that can help you. So, so probably each month plan out if you're going to do an article write-up or an educational thing. Different items you could plan ahead. Um, you could do that the month prior, but there's other weekly meetings and things that come up, such as closings and open houses and caravans that you could plan on Sunday. So a couple different times you should be scheduling your planning and time blocking. Okay, great. All right, we've got just three minutes left. Um, another question here. Let's see, this, uh, this one appears to be for you as well, Greg. Greg, uh, what time of day is best for social posts to be scheduled for? Yeah, so you can schedule posts for, the mornings are, are really active because sometimes people get up and they'll be on their social media platform. So I would say, 
couple could be prior to 8.30. Lunchtime is very popular. And then between the hours of 4 and 6 tend to be popular as well. So, so some content will be live and others you can think about when people are probably not at work or might be on their breaks and plan your post around then. Um, and then you're going to get the most traction because they're not going to busy wrapped up. And normally those are common times people will be checking social media. Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dustin, before I close this up, did you want to share with everybody where they can find this? Yeah, thanks, John. So the uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available on the uh, California NBA uh, website, cnba.com and also on our YouTube channel for free for the next 90 days. And then after that, it'll be available on our members only website. If you have any questions about that, you can certainly email me at uh, Dustin at cmba.com. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Karen. Um, look, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. And you know what? We want to make sure that we do our best to deliver quality content. So I have a favor to ask all of you, if you'll be you, you will be receiving a survey within about an hour. Please take the time to fill that out to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Also, if you have anything you would like to learn about in future webinars, please let us know that as well. Thanks again and have a great day.